So these lenses are kind of a big deal because they capture that anamorphic essence we all lust for as filmmakers, but in the body of a small lightweight zoom. Normally, if you're looking at using an anamorphic zoom lens, you'd have to look at options from Ingenue, Cook, Airy, or Hawk, all of which are simply not budget options, which is why these lenses are sort of a big deal. We shot a few projects with them over the last few months, and right off the bat, these lenses are incredibly compact and actually remind me a lot of Laowa's Ranger series, both in terms of design and character. The original nanomorphs were known for being the world's smallest anamorphic lens, and now these might be the smallest anamorphic zoom lenses and weigh just over three pounds. It's almost like they took a ranger housing and somehow squeezed an anamorphic element inside. They have a 1.5 times squeeze, so they're great options for three x two formats like the Alexa, which is what I used, or even traditional 16 x nine sensors like the Sony FX6. On a 16 by 9 format, a 1.5 squeeze will give you a final aspect ratio of 2.66, and from there you can crop down to a 239 or 2 to 1. The 1.5 times squeeze is a little bit more palatable in terms of extraction without having to crop in as much. For example, if you threw a traditional 2 times anamorphic on a 16 by 9 sensor and wanted a 16 by 9 extraction, you'd literally be chopping away half of your resolution. So the 1.5 times works great for when you're mixing in footage shot in regular 16 by 9, so your crop ends up being really minimal. Now, in terms of monitoring, your best bet is to just use a monitor that supports 1.5 ratios like Small HD or Atomos, because most cameras don't even have an in-camera 1.5 times D-squeeze option. The FX6 is apparently getting 1.5 support in version 5.0 that's expected to hopefully release in May, which is sort of telling of how popular that camera is compared to the FX9, because that camera's last update was nearly two years ago, and it looks like they don't have anything else on their firmware roadmap. It makes sense seeing that the Murano just landed, which might as well be called the FX9 Mark II Pro. Ultimately, deciding on anamorphic lenses just depends on your project's needs, and there's always a little bit of math involved when selecting formats and getting your desired extraction, so I recommend using Phil Holland's Shot Prep tool, which is free on his website. So when you buy these lenses, you can choose from three different flare options, and I opted to test the amber flare version because I personally love the warmer tones, which really grew on me after using them on the Mercury's last year. I thought the nanomorphs had very similar characteristics to the Rangers in terms of sharpness and chromatic aberration. When you're shooting wide open, you sort of tend to get that hazy vintage look with finer details and is reminiscent with a lot of older lenses. Last December, I shot a little family Christmas video with the nanomorph zooms, and it had this perfect vintage look, which felt right for the piece as our grandpa reflected on his life over the years. So really quick, I wanna give a shout out to the sponsor of today's video, and that's Cordbag. Cordbag makes really high quality storage and organizational tools, and when I say these are some of my favorite pieces of kit, I'm not lying. These little pouches make it super easy to keep your gear organized and easy to find, so I literally bring at least one to every job I'm on, whether it's to carry media, batteries, or even hard drives to offload too. They're super functional and have this Velcro strip right on the front so you can add your own labels or patches, a tactical hook on the back so you can clip them to just about anything, and PALS webbing so you can use it like any other Molly accessory. Another great hidden little feature is the little air tag pocket hidden right inside the mesh zipper, so you can keep track of a lot of your high value pouches. I literally have them everywhere. I even have two dangling off my cart where I keep my meters. And I'm a big fan of the belt loop that they sell, and I'll carry my light meter around in a small core pouch just hanging off my waist, so I always keep that thing on me. These new limited edition patches have also been super popular, and my favorite one is probably this cute little donut. If you're interested in checking them out, use my code is that a red on checkout and you can save 15% off your entire order. So get organized and check out Cordbag. So in terms of distortion, these lenses have pretty prominent pincushion distortion, but in all honesty, it never really jumped out at me while I was actually using it. It's also easy enough to correct and resolve if it really means that much to you, but for all the stuff that I've shot so far, I've basically just left it as is. 
Most anamorphic lenses are known for their kind of signature barrel distortion, and when you compare them to something like the Mercury lenses, the difference is night and day. And as beautiful as the Mercury's are, I don't always want that level of distortion, which makes these an easier option for a lot of different projects where you want that anamorphic look. Another great feature is the fact that it's a constant squeeze, so there aren't any anamorphic mumps you have to worry about and won't distort your talent's face if they get too close to the camera. Being a 1.5 times squeeze, you're not going to get as a drastic squeeze as you would with a typical two times anamorphic. And on the wider end, that anamorphic quality honestly isn't as noticeable, so I found myself preferring the 50 to 100 most of the time to get most out of that anamorphic quality. For example, at the longer end of 100 millimeters, you would end up with a horizontal field of view of about 66 millimeters, whereas a 28 millimeters would yield a horizontal field of view of about 18 millimeters. If you wanted a more classic two time squeeze, you could also get Laowa's 1.33 front adapter, which is another great option if you literally wanted to squeeze out as much character as you could. Being that these are zoom lenses, you're essentially whittling down a five lens set to only two lenses, which is pretty handy logistically, not having to worry about bringing an entire lens case with you or traveling with five different lenses in your bag. When we were shooting our commercial over at Yukon Pizza, we probably only had two to three lens swaps for the entire day. One of the most impressive things about this lens is the close focus. During my time with the Nanomorphs, I never once had to fiddle around with diopters, which is pretty wild for an anamorphic lens. For reference, the Cook Anamorphic Zoom, which costs $54,000 by the way, has a close focus of about four feet, while this 50 to 100 has a close focus of two feet, six inches. I ended up staying mostly at a T4, since T29 felt a little soft with a lot of apparent aberration, but anything past that cleaned up pretty nicely. Anamorphics are super fun when they're right for the project, and even though the Nanomorphs don't have quite as much character as something like the Mercury's, sometimes you don't always want all those characteristics cranked up to a 10, which makes these much more practical in documentary applications or any other project where you just want a little bit more flavor than a basic spherical. Being that these lenses cost magnitudes less of the next closest anamorphic zoom, they make for the most affordable option when you're trying to keep things nimble. They're currently running an Indiegogo campaign where you can get a pretty decent early bird discount if you jump on early enough, and the two lens set will retail for about $57.99, which is crazy considering that a full set of Nanomorph Primes goes for $67.49. Either way, it's cool seeing anamorphic lenses become more affordable and available, so even if you're not in the market to buy, you can easily just run a set online for your next project.